Welcome back to Bearing Lifers, the podcast that spins you deep into the fascinating world of bearings. I'm your guide through the bearing jungle, Ben Walls. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just rolling into the industry, Bearing Lifers promises a nice conversation for all. So tighten up your internal clearance as we dive into our second episode, my good friend, Dave Tassie. Today, we have a special guest who's had a few different roles within the bearing world. Without further ado, let me introduce our expert guest, Dave Tassie. Dave, welcome to Bearing Lifers. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, not a problem, man. Thanks for uh, being a part of our second episode. You know, my first little episode of there with uh, Dean must have suckered you right in. Either that <laughs> or this this stellar idea that's going to, you know, appeal to the masses. You know, you know, you want your five minutes of fame. We'll give it to you. All right. Looking forward to it. Good. So uh, let's start off. What? Uh, how did you get into the bearing industry? Tell us a little bit about your back background and your story. Well, like a lot of people, um, I started while I was in college looking in for a part-time job in the paper. And it said, uh, you know, warehouse worker and delivery driver, make your own hours. And it seemed to fit me really well at the time. So I applied and got the job and did that for a couple of years. And once I graduated, they asked me to stay on in sales. And, you know, I had already had a pretty good base, you know, working in the warehouse. I'll tell you, it's it's a really good way to learn because you're looking at all kinds of parts. You're touching them every day. You're seeing what, you know, how big they are, how much they weigh, that type of thing. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I'll try this sales thing in the bearing world for a while and, you know, move on to something else. And now almost 40 years later, I'm still here. That's fantastic, man. What, um, what were the other roles between sales and what you're doing now? What, what's your current role actually, um, you know, what are you contributing to the, the bearing industry and what you're doing now? Well, my current role is is defined as strategic account manager, and that's just kind of focusing on, you know, some of our larger distributors uh, here in the uh, in the aftermarket division um, at NSK. But pretty much I've always been in sales or sales management roles over the years. Uh, I've always enjoyed the field sales aspect of it, um, going to see customers, building those relationships, understanding what they're doing technically. That, that always kind of interests me. So I've always tried to maintain uh, a role within you know those parameters and and have so for pretty much my whole career that's great so you've been in the bearing industry since college i mean mm -hmm. you, you you've started quite a while ago so bearing lifer is uh is a term i've heard in the industry you definitely seem to qualify for that but what are the current challenges you see in the industry that have changed since you started i mean it's it's spanning a you know a, a couple decades so you've seen how business and how that customer business relationship is actually, you know, evolved throughout the years. And especially dealing with the distributors, more and more companies are kind of trying to rely on that or getting away from that. How is that kind of evolving? Well, there's a couple of things. One is clearly it's affecting every aspect of our life. It's the access to information. You know, when I started out, you know, you had catalogs, um, you, you had maybe experts within your company that knew quite a bit about a particular product category. But for the most part, you, you know, we were the experts for the field. And, and the only way that, you know, the, uh, uh, companies were able to acquire that kind of information was to contact you. And, you know, so you, you had a, a little edge, so to speak, on, on being able to uh, really communicate your value to the, to the customer. But now, you know, with the access to information, people come into this with, you know, knowing a lot more than, than they ever did in the past. And sometimes they even bypass using, you know, the so-called experts in the industry because they don't really need it at this point. So once that happens, you know, you, your, your, your company, no matter how much you're doing from a quality or manufacturing standpoint, loses some of its value and, and it uh, commoditizes your product more than it ever did. Um, that's that's probably the major challenge we have now. The secondary challenge that I see is is really trying to trying to uh, make that initial contact with a potential customer. Where in the past, you know, things were a lot looser. Uh, most companies had receptionists. You can you know walk through the door, introduce yourself, hand them a card, and probably get a name, if not a meeting, right at that point. Um, now, you know, the receptionist has kind of went the way of the dodo and, you know, you have automated phone systems and, you know, really firewalls protecting 
purchasing groups or engineering groups. So getting that initial contact is much more difficult now. Do you think some of the, the with with that being said, do you think some of the challenges that some of the customers are running into is because they've painted themselves into a corner by trying to be their own expert and and kind of look at their application and maybe pick something off of Amazon or offline and and they're like, well, this didn't work. Why didn't it work? This should have worked. And you guys are coming in late to the game now to try to kind of reverse engineer what problems the cu customers are having instead of starting there at square one. Right. Clearly, I think that happens uh, quite often where, you know, when you're looking at an ad or a website, a lot of times it could be misleading or you could misinterpret it. To your point, in bringing in a, a, a qualified expert from the beginning, from a de design phase, or especially if you're having a, a, a failure, you know, um, in one of your machines, to bring in somebody from, from point one will really help you understand the problem and solve it a lot uh a lot more quickly and probably a lot less expensively um, than trying to do it yourself. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, what's your most memorable bearing story? I mean, you've been around it a long time. I mean, I, I have a few that people outside the bearing industry might not even believe me just because they're so ridiculous or over the top. I mean, that some of the bearing bearings are in every industry. They're in every application, you know, that's got a rotating part. So what, what, what kind of remarkable or ridiculous bearing story do you got that you could share with us? Well, outside of, you know, my, my folks never really understanding what I did for a living. Um, you, you know, back in the day at the distributor, we would have, everybody had a counter, you know, people would walk in all the time off the street and, you know, sometimes they'd bring a box of, of smashed up metal that you had to try to figure out what bearing was. Um, but especially on Saturday mornings, because we were always open Saturday mornings and you would get your, hobbyist or, you know, somebody trying to fix his lawnmower. But one day we had a gentleman come in and um, he was looking for uh, about eight sets of small trailer hub paper uh, roller bearings. And he told us he was burning these things out every couple of weeks. And we said, every couple of weeks, you know, what are you doing? He goes, well, I don't know. Why don't you come out here and look at what my rig. So we went out there and he had about a 12 foot camper pulled by a pickup. And this camper had pennies glued to it on every square inch. What, what he was trying to do was looking for extraterrestrial signals. And he fashioned his vehicle like a, like a giant radio receiver. So needless to say, the bearings were a little bit overloaded. We sold him some new ones and, and we sent him on his way. And that, that story kind of, you know, early in my career, um, kind of set me up to, to realize that everyone might not be using the bearing correctly. So that, you know, from a few probing questions, you might be able to solve someone's problem pretty quickly. That's, that's ridiculous. Talk about like you leading that to your, your family. My family has no clue either. I'm, I'm, I've been doing this for three generations. They still haven't figured it out, but like going to a family party and be like, Oh, what'd you do at work? Well, this guy was looking for aliens, you know, you know, no wonder they can't figure out what we're talking about because we come back with cool stories, I guess. Yeah, yeah we we always kid around. You wanna you wanna end a conversation at a cocktail party? Just tell somebody what you do for a living, and they won't. Most of the time, they'll just walk away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so, what other bearing lifers in the industry that kind of help mentor you and kind of guide you through this process? I mean, there's a a litany of stellar guys and. We've actually started to recognize a few of these people with like lifetime achievement awards since I've been coming to these uh, the, these annual conferences, and I I can't keep count of how many people that have helped me at least start my journey, let alone you know further on another twenty years where I'm going to be. Certainly, um, a couple stand out. Um, you know, growing or growing up and working in the Chicago area. Um, Tim Breen definitely was, was a big influence on me. You know, I never worked for Barry Baring or Motion Industries, but Tim was a divisional vice president when I, you know, first started out in field sales. And he was so gracious and patient with me and really, you know, he, he was out of my league at the time for, you know, for what my knowledge was, but he really did a great job of, of taking time to help educate me. And that's something that I never forgot, you know, and, you know, all the way up until him becoming president of Motion, he was he was just a, a great guy to deal with. Um, another one is probably Carl James from BDI. You, you know, you, go, you probably won't find a more personable man of, of his stature um, in our industry or, or any industry. 
another gentleman that you know you could pick up the phone or or when you're in Cleveland you could stop by and he always seems to have time for you and always has a kind word and um really I look at people like that and, and I try to say you know that that that's the way that you should be not only in business and but in in, in the rest of your life too right you know yeah. always get have time for no matter you know who that person is uh because it it makes a huge difference um and it makes a difference in and and how we treat people and, and, and how we conduct our business. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I know, I knew Tim pretty well as well. And, and uh, the way you described Carl, I mean, that's, it's kind of like how I feel about you, Dave. I mean, you've really been that type of person for me. So I really appreciate, you know, you, you coming out of the second episode of uh, the podcast we're trying to do here. So thank you. And I appreciate it. And I think that's a testament to a lot of people in our industry when they see that and they receive it, we really do try giving back to it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, well, let's wrap it up with uh, what do you think is coming in the industry? What do you see some of the the unique maybe uh, technologies or where the industry is headed maybe with uh, EV or wind energy or where do you think the industry is going to gravitate to to either a new technology or just a big push? Well, that is a great question, right? Um, and, and it's always hard to predict the future. But something that we're, we're pretty confident that's never going to go away is, you know, you're going to have to have mechanical systems to, to transmit power, right? Yeah. And where in the past, you know, maybe 150 years ago when the bearing industry started, they were putting bearings into, you know, wheels for horse-drawn carts. You know, now they're putting them into wind turbines, right? And, you know, again, is there going to be some transformational technology in the bearing world that's going to completely change things, you know, there might be, but probably what we're looking at is just incremental improvements, you know, in material, in, in manufacturing capabilities, in, in super finishing, that type of thing where bearings are just going to continue to last longer and longer in applications as long as they're lubricated properly, you know, they're, they're fitted properly and installed in the correct way. You know, you'll just see, you know, getting longer and longer life, but you know, with that um, applications, people are going to, you know, demand, you know, more and more out of that bearing. So you're still going to have failures and that type of thing. So I, I don't think we'll, we'll ever run to the point where, you know, people will not need a bearing expert to help them decide, you know, what, what bearing is going to go into, you know, into their application or to improve, you know, an existing application. I think that'll always be there. Um, the internet will continue to help people um, find these solutions and make it easier for them to buy. And it'll, you know, uh, uh, maybe, you know, allow some leakage in, in purchasing to um, less than reliable sources, let's put it that way. But I think that's always been part of commerce. And, and again, it's, it's our responsibility for, from a premium manufacturer to make sure we're communicating why there's value in to, uh, purchasing from us yeah. as opposed to just going on the internet, you know, so it's never been easy. It'll never be easy moving into the future, but it's just, um, you know, evolution uh, in, in the business world that, you know, you, we try to stay on top of it and, and, and benefit from it, uh, you know, for the strength of our companies. Excellent. Well, Dave, thank you so much. I know we're busy guys. We got to keep the whole world spinning. So I'll let you go. Thank you so much for being on. Thanks for having me on, Ben. Take care. Yeah, thank you. As we wrap up this episode of Bearing Lifers, keep an eye out for our next installment. We'll keep spinning tales that keep this industry fascinating. And if you or someone you know is a Bearing Lifer and want to share their story, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Until next time, keep those bearings turning. <laughs>